Hello, this is the second lesson of Unit 1. In this lesson, we will discuss wave motion. Now, what is moving in wave motion? Wave motion, as you will see in the next few minutes, is a mode of energy transfer by using particle vibrations or oscillations as we have seen before. Well, let me see if I can show you one mode of energy transfer. I have a rope that is stretched, actually this is a spring, stretched from one end to the other. If I give a brisk jerk, now see what happens. If I give a brisk jerk on one end, what I'm doing is I'm setting the particles of the spring into up and down simple harmonic vibration. And these vibrations are handed over from segment to segment until the energy moves all the way to the other end and you see that energy gets even reflected. Now, this is what we call wave motion. Now, I don't think there is anybody in this class who has not played with something like this, a slinky. You can see each segment is linked to the other. So, what happens? To work this well, I need some support there, you see? If I give a jerk on one end, you can see the energy gets transferred from one end to the other. Well, these are all examples of wave motion. So, if I ask you what is wave motion, would you be able to tell me? We already talked about this. If you tie one end of a string to a support and uh, give the free end a sudden upward jerk, you can see what you observe. A pulse will be generated and that pulse will move along the rope. You see, the pulse moving along the rope is the vibrations of the segment being handed over from segment to segment. The segments do not move away from their positions. But what is moving? What is moving is the energy. All right. When the pulse reaches the support, it actually gets reflected. The jerk get, sets the segment of the strings into, into vibration, and it is the energy of vibration that gets transmitted through the medium of the spring. All right. The energy of the jerk gets passed on from segment to segment due to, actually, elastic properties of the string. It is the elastic properties that helps to transmit the energy. The segments simply vibrate up and down, and the energy of vibration travels along the length of the rope. Each segment of the rope is set into vibration a little later than the previous segment, and that's the reason why you see the pulse advancing. You see, if a segment is vibrating here, a segment over here will start vibrating a little later. And that is the reason why you see the advancing of the pulse. Now, we will talk about that. That's a very important concept. The vibration of each segment of the row is similar to the simple harmonic vibration of a loaded spring. Now, if you look here, for example, if you put a little pebble into a pool of water, you can see the water will simply be moving up and down. If you look at the waves that are created on water, you might be tempted to feel that the water is moving from one place to another. But if you keep something like this on that water, you will see it will simply be moving up and down. Just the same way a loaded spring will oscillate. In other words, when waves advance in water, water does not move away from place to place. 
what happens is the particles of water simply vibrate up and down and the energy of vibration is handed over from particle to particle. A particle here and a particle here may not be vibrating together. Well, we will develop that concept as we go on. As the energy reaches each molecule a little later, if the molecule is here and the molecule is next to it, the energy reaches the molecule next to it a little later. That means the vibration of those two molecules may not be in step. Now, each subsequent molecule will be in a slightly different phase of vibration. You understand the meaning of phase. We talked about that in our first class. Now, what does phase of vibration mean? Now, watch over here. I can set these two particles into vibration. We can say they are actually in phase. Because when the particle on my right hand moves up, the particle on my left hand also moves along with this. They are in phase. In fact, their phase angles are the same. What happens if they vibrate like this? When the particle on the left starts vibrating up, the particle on the right begins to vibrate down. Look at that. Are they in phase? No. There, we say there is a phase difference. All right, I'm going to develop that concept of phase and phase difference in the next slide. So, the reason why we see the advancing of a wave is that there is a progressive phase difference as the energy keeps moving in the medium. Now, using this concept, we can define wave motion. I'm going to make a definition now for wave motion. Wave motion is a kind of energy transfer in a medium due to the vibrations of the particles of the medium without the particles themselves moving away from their positions. The particles simply vibrate in simple harmonic motion and the energy of vibration is what moves in the medium. So you must be familiar with a definition of wave motion. All right, let's uh, now look at that animation that is created on the web. Let me see if I can uh, access that. Now, if you look at this, this is a good illustration of what a wave is. I have uh, lined up a number of students there, and you can see the first one moves up and down, the energy of vibration reaches each particle. I'm going to call each person a particle. And you can see what phase difference means. Energy travels from one end to the other by handing the vibrations from one particle to the other. And can you understand the meaning of phase difference? Each particle vibrates in a slightly different phase, and you can see the wave profile is created. And you can see the same situation here. This red rod moves back and forth, and that sets the particles into back and forth vibration. The energy of vibration gets transmitted from left to right. And look at the pulse moving on the string that I just showed you. A pulse created on the left gets passed on to the right. Why? Because each particle receives the energy a little later. The phase difference between the particles is what generates that, that wave pulse. Okay, let's uh, move on. I'm going to illustrate the concept of phase and phase difference by using these sets of particles. Look at particles 1 and 2. There are two particles there. I'm going to use... Um, now, here is particle 1 and here is particle 2. They are both beginning to move together. Look at that. They move in phase. Now, 
Look at particles 3 and 4. When particle 3 is beginning to move up, particle 4 is beginning to move down. Can you tell me what is the phase difference between the two particles? You see, phase is measured using an angle. Is that right? If you recall, look at that. At the equilibrium position, the phase is zero. If you go to the upper extreme, the phase is pi by two. Come back, the phase is pi. Go to the lower extreme, the phase is three pi by two. Come back to the equilibrium position, the phase is two pi. So, now tell me. The left particle is beginning to move up, the right particle is beginning to move down. What is the phase difference between those two particles? It means the first particle on the left is beginning to vibrate. This one has completed half a vibration. Now it's beginning to go down. The phase difference is pi. Now, when the phase difference is pi, they vibrate completely in the opposite fashion. Is that right? So, the phase difference between particles 3 and 4 is pi. Right. Particles 1 and 2 are in phase. They are in the same phase. Whereas particles 3 and 4, what is the phase difference we said? The phase difference is pi. That means they are completely out of phase. All right, anybody tell me what is the phase difference between particles 5 and 6? Now, particle 5 is in the equilibrium position, beginning to move down. Particle 6 has gone all the way up. And now that means the particle 6 is ahead of particle 1 by pi by 2. So the phase difference is pi by 2. Can you understand that? The phase difference between particles 5 and 6 is pi by 2. Particle 1 begins to move up. Particle 2 has actually reached all the way up. Begins to move down. Okay. Tell me then, what is the phase difference between particles 7 and 8? We just talked about uh, the particles 5 and 6. All right. So the phase difference, let's talk about again one more time. The particles 1 and 2 are in the same phase. Particles 3 and 4 differ by phase pi. The phase difference is pi. Particles 5 and 6 is, has a phase difference of pi by 2. Anybody tell me the phase difference between particles 7 and 8? All right. 7 and 8. 7 is in the equilibrium position beginning to move down, be beginning to move up. 8 has gone all the way up, back to equilibrium position, and now at the lower extreme. Look at this. Pi by 2, pi, 3 pi by 2. The phase difference between particles 7 and 8 is 3 pi by 2. You see, there is also another way to define the phase, that is using the period. Now, how do we use the period to define phase? All right, let's look at this one now. They are the same phase. All right, that same phase. How about 3 and 4? You see, 3 is beginning, whereas, uh, whereas 4 has completed half a vibration. It has gone through half a period. You see that? So, the phase difference between 3 and 4, which we said in terms of angle, it is pi radians. But in terms of period, it is half of a period. Particles 3 and 4 differ by half of a period. Tell me, what about the, the phase difference between particles 5 and 6 using the period? When particle 1 just begins, particle 2 has gone up to the extreme up. That means it has gone a quarter of a period. Is that right? A quarter, another quarter, a third quarter, and a fourth quarter. The full period is made up of four quarters. So, 
the phase difference between particles 5 and 6 is a quarter of a period. Okay, in that case tell me what is the phase difference between particles 7 and 8 using the period. It will be, this has gone up one quarter, come down a second quarter, come down here a third quarter. The phase difference between these two particles is three quarters of a period. Well, once you understand the meaning of phase and phase difference, I'm now going to construct a wave model. I want you to listen and understand this. I have five particles of a medium. I'm going to set the first particle in the vibration and the energy gets transferred to the second, the third, fourth and ultimately it reaches the fifth. And we are going to assume that the phase difference between these two particles is a quarter of a period. What does that mean? It means when the first particle completes a quarter of a vibration, the energy will adjust to reach the second particle. That's the meaning. So our assumption is that the phase difference between the particles in vibration is how much? A quarter of a period. Okay. Now consider five particles of the medium. The phase difference between the particles is one-fourth of a period. Remember, one-fourth of a period is the same as an angle of pi by two. Alright, that means by the time the first particle completes a quarter of a vibration, the energy just reaches the second particle. Alright. What happens after another quarter of a period? After another quarter, the first particle has come back. It has completed half a vibration. The second particle has completed a quarter of a vibration and the energy just reaches the third particle. You see that? So once again, the first particle has completed half a vibration. The second particle has completed a quarter of a vibration. The energy just reaches the third particle. Well, I want you to look at that one more time. And so, this is the first particle, here is the second particle, and here is the third particle. Look at the wave profile getting made. Can you tell me, what will be the state of vibration after another quarter of a period? Well, let's talk about it. After another quarter, this will go down to the lower extreme, this will come back to the equilibrium and this will go up quarter of a vibration. That's right. So, in a time 3t over 4, our first particle is here, the second particle has come back to the equilibrium, the third particle goes up, all the way up, and where does the energy reach? It reaches the fourth particle. And look at the the profile of the particle. Look at how the wave profile beginning to take shape. Tell me what happens after another t by 4. That means after a full period. We have now gone through three quarters. What happens after another quarter of a period in one full period? You can see the first particle has come back. It has completed one vibration, one full period. Where is the second particle? It is now all the way down here. It has completed three quarters of a period. Where is this third particle? It's at the equilibrium position. And the energy just reached. No. Where is the fourth particle? The fourth particle has gone all the way there. So look at the... And the energy just reached the fifth particle. And look at the wave profile. You have now one full wave. Look at that. What is a full wave? A full wave is the distance traveled by the wave by the time the first particle has completed one vibration. And you can see particle 1 and particle 5 are now going to vibrate in phase, aren't they? That's right. Okay, particle 1 and particle 5 are now going to go together. They will be in phase. And these two are the two nearest particles. 
that are in the same phase of vibration. All right. So by the time particle one completes one vibration, the energy reaches the fifth particle. That means the distance advanced by the wave in a time of one period. You see? That one period is the time taken by one particle to complete one vibration. During that time, the wave advanced this distance. And this distance is called the wavelength of the wave. So what is the definition for wavelength? Wavelength is the distance advanced by the wave during one period the time taken for a particle to complete one vibration. You can also define wavelength as the distance between two nearest particles that are in the same phase of vibration. Is that right? And we will represent wavelength by the Greek letter lambda. I suppose you're familiar with that, that letter. Lambda represents the wavelength. So, a wave has a wavelength. What is the wavelength? Wavelength is the distance advanced by the wave. In other words, the energy. It is the energy that is advancing. The distance advanced by the wave in one full period. Okay. Let's now talk about a wave equation. Now, a wave equation gives us a relation between wavelength, wave speed, and wave frequency. What's a wave frequency? Wave frequency is the number of waves generated per second. Well, if you understand that, it is the same as the frequency of vibration of a particle. All right. We can use the definition of wavelength to get an equation for the wave speed. Well, if V is the speed of the wave, then we can write V is distance traveled divided by time. Is that right? You know that very well. Now, if the distance traveled is a wavelength, what is the time taken to travel that distance? Well, if you know the definition of wavelength, the distance equal to one wavelength is traveled by the wave in a time of one period. So, if I call this distance as a wavelength, this time becomes the period. There you are. So, I can write V, therefore, is lambda divided by T, where T is the period. Well, I'm going to write it like this. 1 over T multiplied by lambda. Isn't it the same? Yes. What is 1 over T equal to? 1 over the period. 1 over the period is the frequency. And so, what is our wave equation? Our wave equation, such a beautiful equation, says V, the wave speed, equal to frequency of wave times wavelength. A very important equation. You can never forget that. V equal to F lambda. Alright, there I have a wave. Now, a wave can now be characterized. You can see when you look at the wave, there are places wave where the particles are at a maximum displacement. We call such a point the crest of a wave. A point where particles are at the lowest point of the displacement, we call it a trough. So a wave can be represented by crest and trough. And look at this. Isn't that the amplitude of vibration? And we call that the amplitude of the wave. And this is a wavelength. You see that? If you measure the distance from a crest to a crest, that will be a wavelength. If you measure the distance from a trough to a trough, that will also be a wavelength. All right. We talked about all that. The distance between two adjacent crests is a wavelength. The distance between two adjacent troughs is also a wavelength. Let's now distinguish between transverse and longitudinal waves. Transverse and longitudinal waves. Well, now, when I showed you the example of wave, 
you noticed that uh, it's... I'm sorry. I messed up that, is that right? Well, that happens. Let's do it again. Hope I will not be able to repeat that fiasco again. Alright, now in this case, if I set the particles in the up and down vibration, can you see that? The particles are moving up and down, the waves, the wave is advancing at right angles to it. So, when particles are set in the up and down vibration, the energy goes at right angles to it. That is one type of a wave, we call that a transverse wave. On the other hand, if you look at the waves that is generated on a slinky, now, you see, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to vibrate the segments of the slinky back and forth. Look at this. The, the segments are vibrating back and forth. The energy of vibration advances in the same direction. The direction of particle vibration and the direction of the wave propagation are the same. And such a wave is a longitudinal wave. Well, I'm going to write them down for you. If the particle vibration is at right angles to the direction of propagation of a wave, it is called a transverse wave. And there is the example. The segments vibrate up and down. You can see the vibration of the segments is up and down and the energy transfer is at right angles. That is a transverse wave. Alright? How about a longitudinal wave? In the case of a longitudinal wave, the particle vibration is in the same direction as the direction of propagation of the wave. This is a slinky that I showed you. The particles of a slinky, the segment vibrates back and forth and the energy gets propagated like this. You see here the, the difference? The particles vibrate back and forth, the energy, the wave propagation is in the same direction. So, you should be able to distinguish. I have asked you to write a paragraph in one of the writing assignments. Uh, write a paragraph uh, by distinguishing between transverse and longitudinal waves. I want you to collect information on it and write a full page. Don't copy and paste from other sources, but write it on your own. What are the main differences between transverse and longitudinal waves? All right. Now, let's see if I can take you to... Now, here you see a good example of longitudinal waves. Can you see the difference there? Longitudinal waves, the, the particles are set into vibration. Now, concentrate on one particle. See the particle I'm pointing? It's simply vibrating back and forth. And the energy just advances to the right. And that's a beautiful illustration of the longitudinal waves. Now, look at the transverse waves. In the case of a transverse wave, particles vibrate up and down, the energy is transmitted to the right. If you concentrate just on one particle, you see the particle simply vibrate up and down. Okay, let's move on from there. How about uh, another example? Let's see if we can get that one open. Give me a second. I think it'll, it'll open. All right, it is uh, not going to open now, I think. So we're going to leave it at that. Well, that's a pity. It was a very good illustration of the difference between transverse and longitudinal waves. 
Well, let's now talk about the speed of transverse vibrations on a stretched string. When you stretch a string, like the one I just showed you, the one I just toppled, you see, if you stretch a string, I don't want to pull it too much because it's going to topple. And if you pluck one end, how fast does the pulse move? That's what we're going to look at. Speed of transverse vibrations on a stretch string. What is the speed of uh, the speed with which the energy is transmitted along the string? Well, here you got a pulse that is moving with a speed v. I'm going to simply give you the equation. I'm not going to derive it for you, but you need to remember the equation. What are the parameters? Suppose you stretch a string by using a tension T. What does that mean? The tension of the stretch string is T. You see, the tension depends on the force of pull. The reason why this fell off the first time I wanted to show you is I used too much tension. So the tension is the force of stretch. Now, so, the speed of propagation will depend on the tension. How much is the tension? It will also depend, depend on another quantity called mass per unit length. We will represent that by the Greek letter mu. What does mass per unit length mean? If you take one meter of the string, how much, does, how much is its mass? So this quantity mu is the mass per unit length. Okay, and the equation for the speed is V equal to square root of T over mu. That means the speed of transverse waves on a stretched string is given by square root of its tension divided by mass per unit length. That means if you stretch it with a greater force, the speed will also be greater. And what does this tell you? Mu is on the denominator. You see, mu gives us an idea of thickness of the string. If mu is greater, you have a thicker string. The string gets thicker, the speed will be, will be less, and so on. All right, let's uh, use the concept we developed so far to do a couple of examples. One end of a string, six meter long, is moved up and down with simple harmonic motion at a frequency of 60 hertz. The wave reaches the other end of the string in 0.5 seconds. What is the wavelength of the wave in the string? Well, you have, what do we know? We know the, the length of the string. That means you know how much the wave is going to travel, how long. We know the frequency of the wave. All right, let's write down. Delta x equal to 6 meter. Delta x stands for the length. So the distance the wave travels is the length of the string. I'm going to call that delta x. So delta x is 6 meter. The frequency of the wave on that string is 60 hertz. And the time taken for the wave to travel from one end to the other is 0.5 seconds. Well, you know from your understanding of uh, basic physics that delta x divided by delta t is the rate at which the distance is being covered, is that right? And that is called speed. So, the wave travels the length of the string in 0.5 seconds. So, wave speed is delta x divided by delta t, distance divided by time. So, that will be 6 meter divided by 0.5 seconds. That is 12 meter per second. And now, we, what do we want to find? What is the wavelength of the wave? All right, we now go to the wave equation. Do you remember that equation? V equal to F lambda. We know the value of V, 12 meters per second. We know the frequency, 60 hertz. We find lambda. So lambda equal to V over F. 
and we know both these values, therefore lambda, the wavelength, is 0.2 meter. All right, let's do another one. The wavelength of violet light is 7 times 10 to the negative 7 meter. Now, remember, the wave equation V equal to F lambda can be applied to all types of waves, including light waves. That's what we're going to do here. Wavelength of violet light is 7 times 10 to the negative 7 meter. Wavelength of violet light is very, very small. All right. If the speed of light is 3 times 10 to the 8 meter per second, what is the frequency of violet light? A very simple one-step problem. I have given you the wave speed. I have given you the wave frequency. You need to find... Oh, I'm sorry. I, I gave you the wave length. I gave you the wave speed. You want to find the frequency. All right. So... Wave length is given, wave speed is given, and we use the equation V equal to F lambda. All right? If V equal to F lambda, what is uh, F equal to? F equal to V over lambda, that will be speed of light, divided by its wavelength. And you can see that's a very big number. It's 4.29 times 10 to the 14 hertz. Violet light vibrates 4.29 times 10 to the 14 times a second. And its wavelength is very, very small. Okay, another problem. A steel wire is 7 meter long and has a mass of 100 grams. It is under tension of 900 Newton. What is the speed of transverse wave pulse on this wire? Anybody recall the equation I gave you for speed of transverse waves on a stretched string? Well, the speed depends on the tension. I gave you the tension. Also, it depends on the mass per unit length. Well, I gave you the mass, I gave you the length. Can you find the mass per unit length? Let's do that. Delta x, the length of the string is 7 meter. The mass of the string is 100 gram, which is 0.1 kilogram. Always remember to convert it to proper units. And the tension of the string is 900 newton. What do we do? First, we obtain the mass per unit length mu. Can you find mu for me? If you got the length of the string and its mass, what is mu equal to? Mass per unit length. Mu is mass divided by length. So mu equal to m divided by delta x. That is 0.1 kilogram divided by 7 meter. That is 0 0.0143 kilogram per meter. That's the unit of mass per unit length. All right? We've got mass per unit length, mu. We've got the tension. Calculate the speed. V equal to square root of T over mu. Recall that equation? All right. Let's put the value. Square root 900 Newton divided by 0 0.0143 kilogram per meter and that is 251 meter per second is the speed of waves on that string all right another problem transverse waves travel at 150 meter per second on a wire of length 80 centimeter that is under a tension of 500 Newton. What is the mass of the wire? Well, basically the same equation we will use. Is that right? You need to find the mass of the wire. You are given the speed, you are given the tension. You know that speed and tension are related. What else is there in that equation? V equal to square root of T over mu. 
So if you use that equation, you can find mu, the mass per unit length. All right. We need to find the mass of the wire. We know its length. Well, if you know the mass per unit length, and you know the length, you can then find the mass of the wire, can't you? Yes. All right, let's do that. Length of the string is 0.8 meter. The speed of waves on that string is 150 meter per second. And the tension on the string is 500 newton. So, what do we do first? Well, we first obtain the mass per unit length mu using the wave equation V equal to square root T over mu. Can you solve for mu from here? Can you do that in your mind? First of all, square both sides. V squared equal to T over mu. Or mu will be T divided by V squared. So, V squared is T over mu. Can you now solve for mu? Mu equal to T divided by V squared. We know our T. We know our V. And therefore, it is 500 Newton divided by 150 meter per second squared. And that's equal to 0 0.022 kilogram per meter. All right? Now, that is mu. We need to find the mass of the wire. How do we find the mass of the wire? Well, mass equal to length multiplied by mass per unit length. Do you understand that? Because mu is mass divided by delta x. And therefore, mass will be delta x multiplied by mu. That will be length of the string multiplied by its mass per unit length and that is 0 0.018 kilogram. All right, this is a very simple problem. Another one? Okay. A wave pulse propagates along a wire in the positive x direction at 20 meter per second. What will the pulse velocity be? A if we double the length of the wire, keeping the tension and mass per unit length a constant. We double the length of the wire. I think some of you may be able to answer that question directly now. Now, what are the factors on which the speed of wave depend on? If you recall that equation, what's the equation for the speed of wave? V equal to square root T over mu. Well, does it depend on the length? No, it only depends on tension and mass per unit length. You see, the speed does not depend on length. So, if you double the length, will the speed change? No, that's a very simple question. All right, B, double the tension while holding the length and mass per unit length a constant. And double the mass per unit length while holding the other variables a constant. All right, let's do each, each one of these. Now, we know this is the equation that's going to be central to this problem. Is that right? The speed of transverse wave on a string is square root t over mu. In part A, we talked about it. The velocity of transverse wave on a wire does not depend on its length. There is no length factor there. Therefore, if we double the length, the velocity will remain the same. All right, how about B if you double the tension? When the tension is doubled, let the new velocity be V1. So, we can now transform this equation. V1 equal to square root of, when the tension is doubled, it will become 2T. Is that right? So, V1 equal to square root of 2T divided by V. All right. Look at the way I'm going to write it. I'm going to take that 2 out and write it separately. 
Is it okay if I write it that way? It will be square root 2 times square root t over mu. Okay? Why did I do that? Because square root t over mu equal to v, the original speed. So, therefore, the new speed now v1 will be square root 2 times v. When you double the tension on the string, the speed will become square root 2 times the original speed. That's what it means. Alright. Now, the original speed is given to be 20 meters per second. So, the new speed, when the tension is doubled, will be square root 2 times 20. That will be 28.3 meters per second. Alright, what happens if you double the mass per unit length? We will make the same assumption. Let the new velocity be V2 when this mass per unit length is doubled. So, I have then V2 equal to square root T over 2 mu. You see, mu is doubled. Tell me how would I simplify this. I will again take that 2 out and bring it, but then that square root 2 is going to be on the denominator. Look at this. It will be 1 over square root 2 times square root t over mu. And what can I replace this with now? Square root t over mu equal to v. So that will be 1 over square root 2 times v. And v is given to us which is 20 meter per second. So that will be 20 meter per second divided by square root 2. And that's 14.14 meter per second. You notice that when the tension is doubled, the speed increased. Whereas when the mass per unit length is doubled, which means the string became thicker, the speed decreased. Okay. Let's do another problem. The cable of a ski lift runs 400 meter up a mountain and has a mass of 80 kilogram. When the cable is struck with a transverse blow at one end, the return pulse is detected 12 seconds later. What is the speed of the wave? What is the tension in the cable? Well, you have a, a cable stretched from the bottom to the top of a ski lift. Is that right? And what do we have here? When the cable is struck with a transverse blow, give it a blow. Now, how long does it take for the pulse to return? The pulse returns in 12 seconds. Now, that means... 12 seconds is the time taken to go all the way to the length of the string and back. So, this 12 seconds is the time taken not to travel 400 meter, but 400 meter that way and 400 meter back is 800 meter. So, you got delta x is 400 meter, m is 80 kilogram, delta t is 12 seconds. And then you've got to make this argument. 12 seconds is the time taken for the pulse to travel the length of the cable and return. And therefore, V equal to 2 delta X. You see that? This is the total distance traveled. 400 meters that way and 400 meters back. 2 times delta X divided by delta T. That is 2 times 400 divided by 12, that is 66.7 meter per second. And that is the speed of waves on that string. What else do we know? Well, we know that the mass of this string is 80 kilogram, its length is 400 meter, we can find the mass per unit length, is that right? Alright, let's do that. The mass per unit length is m over delta x, mass divided by length. And that is 80 kilogram divided by 400 meter is 0.2 kilogram meter per second. 
Okay, we need to find the tension on the cable. We know the speed of the waves on that string. We know the mass per unit length. Therefore, we can find the tension. Is that right? V equal to square root of T over mu. We need to solve for T. So, obviously, you need to square that equation. V squared equal to T over mu. What is therefore T equal to? Is V squared multiplied by mu. So t equal to v squared multiplied by mu, and that will be 66.7 squared multiplied by 0.2. And that's equal to 890 newton is the tension on that string. Is that right? Before we close this lesson, I would like you to uh, look at this animation that we missed some time ago. I was trying to pull this up, uh, but I could not. Now, here is a good demonstration of the difference between a transverse wave and a longitudinal wave. You have a transverse wave given on the top, a longitudinal wave given at the bottom. I want you to look at the characteristics of a transverse wave and the longitudinal wave. Now, first of all, I want you to watch just this particle. You see the one that is in red? I don't know if it will be recorded properly. I'm pointing on to that one. You can see that red particle simply moves up and down. If you notice, every particle is simply moving up and down. Just concentrate on one particle. There you are. It simply moves up and down. And how does the wave profile get generated? Because of the progressive phase difference. When a particle on a crest is at its maximum displacement, a particle on a trough is at its lowest point, and that's what gives the crest and the trough. So a transverse wave is characterized by the crest and the trough. The crest and trough are formed which advances in the medium. If you notice the crest, look at the, I'm going to go over the crest. A crest advances, look at that. A trough advances, and so on. And that's what a, a, a transverse wave is. Look at a longitudinal wave. A longitudinal wave, the direction of particle vibration. Particles vibrate back and forth, and the wave moves in the same direction. Now, as a result, if you notice there, just watch the red particle there. This red one is moving back and forth. Now, while the particle is moving to the right, they all get crowded together. You see that? They move to the right, they get crowded. When the particles are moving to the left, they get farther apart. So, in place of the crest and trough for a transverse wave, for a longitudinal wave, what you have is regions of high density, regions of low density are formed, which then transfer along the medium. If you look at the region of high density, look at that, it's moving to the right. A region of low density moving to the right. There you are. So for a, a longitudinal wave, regions of high density where the particles are crowded together and they move on, and a region where the particles are farther apart. Now, in place of a crest, you have a compression where they are close together. In place of a trough, you have a rarefaction. What does rare mean? Not very many particles. So a longitudinal wave is characterized by compressions and rarefactions. And uh, we will talk about this soon. So before I close, I'm going to say one more thing about this. When a particle is vibrating in the direction of the wave, it is in a region of compression. When the particle is vibrating against the direction of the wave, it is in a region of rarefaction. So, a transverse wave is characterized by crests and trough. 
a longitudinal wave is characterized by regions of high density called compressions and regions of low density called rarefactions. It's a beautiful illustration of the difference between a longitudinal wave and a transverse wave. All right, I'm going to close this lesson now. We will look at the characteristics, more about the characteristics of waves in the next lesson.